All right, Lyric Armstrong, real estate agent and advocate. Turns out our very first zoning video um, disappeared, won't open. I don't know, it's stuck, it has technical issues. So we're going to refilm it right now. We are in Judge Middleton's court. We are looking at a zoning case. Um, this happens to do with chickens and chicken coops, right? Remember, this is Michigan law, Michigan ordinance for this particular township. But nonetheless, it is something to take into consideration when you are purchasing a home. Is the home conducive for what you plan on doing with it, right? Are you planning to keep it a single family residence? Do you want to make it a multi-unit? Is it something you can get rezoned and get a permit for? You got to find those things out. And let's see what happened with these litigants. Um, it turns out the resolution is not so bad. And this is kind of a favorable thing for the defendants if they actually went ahead and took it to court. Um, in some instances, you may find it more favorable just to pay the fines and deal with the um, the, the commissioner's office, the zoning office in general, but this particular litigant defendant went ahead and, took it and uh, had fought it or at least ignored it enough that they had to go to court to actually have court intervention. And consequently, it does have a favorable outcome for them. So let's see what's happening. Judge Middleton, we're ready for court. Can you please let us in, sir? We are ready for court. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. This might be something you know, but who knows? Someone else on the other side may not. So go ahead and share it just in case they need to find out. All right, Judge Middleton, we are here. We are here. We're going to speed this up just because... Good morning, everyone. Today is June the 8th, Good and uh, we have a zoning hearing this morning, uh, which we blocked out two and a half hours. Hopefully, we won't need that much time. It's kind of some local interest. It's a beautiful day here. If you don't count Canadian wildfire smoke, I knew it was going to be a good day when I heard Jimmy Buffett's fruitcakes on the drive-in this morning. And so uh, I think this case will be interesting. We did not have any arraignments or anything earlier this morning. We do have a number of criminal last pretrial scheduled for this afternoon. Um, Having um, we go on uh, Friday and Monday, so. Be dark for a long Having this particular set of hearing for um, zoning is a good reminder. You hire professionals to do professional uh, things. Right? You hire a, your uh, agent to help you locate the Australia. what you're looking for, as well as and then consequently you will home inspection. Home inspector to check the property. They'll let you know fundamentally if there's some Virginia. concerns, and if so, and then you would go and get a contractor in that field to find out get, really uh, set a set major a COVID, such as dealing with foundational issues or the roofing. I had a time when um, the foundation morning, had all these cracks, and I was so concerned. So I had a contractor come out. Turned out it was just the stucco head was coming off the siding, but I wanted to make sure it wasn't the foundation. So things like that right you have those professionals do that well guess what you also need to check in and see if you plan on doing some farming <laughs> if you plan on you know living off your land is that allowed based upon your town your city ordinance and this litigant is going to find out that the city has some thoughts about it all right let's get here we got the plaintiff coming in um, we're waiting on the defendant. As usual, we keep the volume up so that we can hear all the whispers. Come up and have a seat. We'll get ready to go. So you should turn your volume down, or at the very least, touch your ears. I don't want you to lose your hearing. So we can get all right. Plaintiff's in the house. Defense. So on. Good morning, everyone. We're about to we make a record in the matter of Fabius Township versus Joanna Holmes and Gabriel Holmes. Joanna Holmes' file numbers are 222301-ON, 222364-ON, and 222388-ON. Gabriel Holmes' file numbers are 22302-ON, 222365-ON, and 22389-ON. Uh, each is charged with three separate zoning violations. The first is from November 30th of 2022. It is a, not in compliance with, I can't remember which one was which, but uh, then the second one is dated November 30th and the third citation is dated December 6th, all of 2022. Uh, we were here previously and uh, on March 16th, it took us all the way from March to June to get this briefed and scheduled and I apologize. Uh, and uh, 
the matter had been originally heard as a civil infraction zoning violation, the magistrate dismissed them. The matters were appealed and requested formal hearing by the township. When we were here in March, the court just before the hearing got a large packet of information, which we've now had a chance to review, and so has the defendant. And we attempted to narrow the arguments at that time, and the court requested legal memorandums and scheduled matter for hearing. Each party did an excellent job of briefing the matter, and I had an opportunity to review this earlier this week and again this morning, and the briefs really did help in clarifying and narrowing the issues. Uh, the township is represented by Catherine Kaufman, and their zoning enforcement officer, Douglas Kuhlman, is also present. The defendants are present, and they're represented by attorney Paul Morgan of Willis & Willis in Kalamazoo. Uh, there are, as I indicated, three sets of citations. The defendant claims the first set of citations from November 30th are moot, as the, the, there have been some changes made, and the other two may still be relevant. So, Ms. Kaufman, thank you for your brief and the attachments. Everybody essentially attached the same stuff. There are several issues here, um, including the viability of the ordinance, and whether there even is an ordinance that prohibits this. If there is, does the Michigan Right to Farm Act supersede that? If it does, are the defendants in compliance with the general? And so some of the things that I pointed out originally, <laughs> I guess does it's mute subject now because that video is, is stuck. <laughs> but um, when you're thinking about how the tiers of the law goes, um, you have to remember that the state law will supersede, right, any other law. And no other law within that state is supposed to conflict. And so that becomes a question within this case, does the ordinance, which is a lower law, it's passed by the city, this one's the township, you know, same, same element, city, township, they pass the ordinance for that particular town, for that particular sector. And um, they believe that they're in tandem, that they have a parallel um, presentation. And the question becomes towards the end, are they actually in conflict with what the state ordinance is? And I kind of can relate to that because living in a, uh, a PUD, a, you know, a planned dwelling, I have single family residences all around me, but we're all under an HOA. So we're not an apartment building. We all have individual home ownership, but we are still under an HOA. And so our HOA cannot pass any particular regulation or restriction that is in violation of a state law or, you know, a, even a city ordinance law, right? Because we're underneath the city ordinance as far as, um, as far as uh, per, uh, ranking, if you will. So consequently with the city ordinance, it becomes a question within this case in this matter does it conflict with the state's ordinance or the state's law? And like I said, it becomes favorable in the end. Go ahead to the other video. We accepted agricultural that, management right now, practices known back, as back GAMPs. And not too lost thirdly, are doing. the building, or fifthly, or whatever number we're on, are the buildings properly located? And are they even accessory buildings under the township's definition in the ordinance? Um, there may be other issues that I didn't set out, but um, Ms. Holmes uh, and Mr. Holmes are here. And Ms. Kaufman Township is the plaintiff here. I'll give you the first opportunity to argue. Good morning, Catherine Kaufman, on behalf of Fabius Township. Um, as, as briefly alluded to in our previous uh, hearing in March, Fabius Township is a zone community in St. Joseph County, and the defendants um, for the last few years have owned property zone for residential use at 13240 Broadway. Um, since sometime in 2021 or 2022, they have kept farm animals, ducks, chickens, and roosters at different times on their property in violation of the township zoning ordinance. Township zoning administrator Doug Kuhlman has issued three citations to Gabriel Holmes and three citations to Joanna Holmes for zoning violations for keeping farm animals in a residential district and for locating accessory structures in a front yard in that zoning district. The township will prove beyond preponderance that on each of the citation dates, and we had it as November 30th, 12, 6, and 12, 13, defendants were in violation of the township zoning ordinance. Moreover, the township will prove, uh, excuse me, approve beyond a preponderance that in each case, defendants are unable to assert the right to farm or GAMPs as an affirmative defense to the zoning violations because defendants were not in compliance with all relevant GAMPs on those dates. The township will ask this court to find defendants responsible and to prohibit ongoing violations of the zoning ordinance on that property. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, Mr. Morgan? So, I mean, I hope you, straightforward arguments, very good um, layout for the arguments. You know, they are contending that they have three um, violations. 
because the ordinance was violated and they're not covered by the GAMS GAMS is the rights to um, farm act. So we'll hear from defense as to his rebuttal to those items. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. of defense under the right to farm requires uh, showing a farming operation that is commercial and that's in conformity with GAMP. So the, the evidence will show that today. Uh, we have shown that and will show that. Uh, we have uh, heretofore provided proof of sales of not just one egg, as the law would certainly require as a very low baseline, but egg sales from every month uh, from through uh, 20,000, from 2022 through 23. Uh, and at our last hearing, there were, was discussion with the court about correspondence from the state of Michigan and the party stipulated to the admissibility of those letters from Mr. Corson uh, with the Right to Farm program. And Your Honor, just by way of introduction, this is Mr. Jay Corson here on the right with us here today. Uh, and uh, there was an, a question. I love his uh, court decorum. So he's using his left hand and he's like, oh, here, Your Honor, is so-and-so to the court's right because it's like stage left, stage right, okay? It's that essence. The judge is squeezing him, so to his right is where the individual is. And I love the fact that he does so to the honest point of view and not trying to make him, you know, switch around. Anyway, that's just a little cute. At that time, because of a letter- uh, Obsolete things- That was provided in January of this, of, of this year, uh, essentially resolving the complaint or alleged violation of GAMP uh, issue that had been that had arisen sometime in November and presumably led to these uh, citations that we're here talking about. And there was some confusion, I think, here between us because that letter suggested that that one issue had been resolved. But if you want further full uh, review of, of or evaluation of conformity of GAMPs at this point in time, you know, you need to call our office. I just want to. Which issue are you discussing? The manure management issue or the building placement? I'm talking about the, yes, I, I guess it would fall under the manure management. I'm talking about the, the approval by. Okay, so I want you to guys just to know this. I think that we have a right to farm, and I think we should live off of the land. It's our biblical right, right? <laughs> but I don't know how much citation of the Bible you can do for, for law, but nonetheless, I just think, you know, you should be able to. Um, however, you also have neighbors, and the neighbors are for real, okay? <laughs> they are not, as much as this will get into definitions and where something is located it's really about the noise and because of the covering of the right to farm um they really can't argue the noise so they're arguing these other point factors that will come a little later but um if you are going to have a farm or you're thinking about you know getting into farming because you want to live off the land and want to kind of take things back a little notch in regards to uh, domestic abilities, I support you, I salute you. Just remember that you have to research all elements of this particular venture. And a part of that is the manure, right? How are you getting rid, rid of that waste? Because it, it can become toxic and be toxic. So you can't just have it out. You can't just leave it around every which way. And then, and then like bird poop, you know, chicken poop mm. by the uh, <laughs> by the MDARD. But I love uh, chicken. I do. I still for granting <laughs> uh, granting their uh, right to farm. And the reason I bring this up now, Your Honor, is uh, just to let you know that as of May 31st of this year, we do have an additional letter from the state confir confirming full con uh, compliance with okay, we're in compliance. And I've provided that to as of for the township. <clears throat> Later January and exhibit binders here that include that document for the court's review as well as we move forward here. Um, I, the bottom line is. We, we believe that we will establish that they are in conformity with GAMP, that they have the ability to assert as a defense uh, to a nuisance action here, uh, right to farm. And furthermore, uh, that this coop that is less than 64 square feet and movable it certainly does not fall under the definition of a accessory building under the uh, ordinance, violate, alleged ordinance violation of section 693. So there's really two ordinance violations here. One was, of course, as, as Your Honor mentioned, from November, that was section 292, that does not deal in any way, shape, or form with the ability or prohibition of chickens. That ordinance has to do purely with a building setback requirement. And within days of being served that ordinance, not because of the ordinance necessarily, but certainly part of that, more importantly, because of the review of the state that came out during the month of November and said, yeah, we'd like you to move this somewhere else. 
they did move the, the building to the front yard. So they basically were in compliance. And and then, and then of course, now the, the second set of violation ordinance, ordinance violations relate to this fact that, uh, you know, the township prohibits successor buildings in the front yard. So uh, we're confident that, uh, that those uh, ordinances are, are invalid on their face and in any event preempted by, by right to farm. And I think the legal issue that we have here as it relates to the right to farm and the preemption goes to uh, conflict. And, uh, you know, essentially, the statute in Michigan real clearly states that the township won't enact ordinances or enforce ordinances that somehow conflict or restrict agricultural practices that are protected under the right to farm. And it's the township's position that this particular ordinance prohibiting accessory buildings in the front yard is not in conflict, citing a 2008 case, Troy, uh, that we would suggest is distinguishable. That case related to greenhouses and not, you know, nuisance or noise from animals, et cetera. So distinguishable, of course, means that they're two different issues that and so everything about both sides is that they agree that these are the laws. They agree that this is in place. But they don't agree that it applies to this case. And the defendant is saying it doesn't apply to them because they're covered by the Right to Farm Act and your ordinance can't contradict the Right to Farm Act. And they're saying, we're not contradicting. We're not counseling that. Out. You have the right to farm, but you still have to do these particular um, ordinances. You still have to be 250 feet away from your non-farming neighbor. You still have to have an enclosure and then a setback. I think that's what they got cited for, the setback, okay? And, uh, oh, and setback usually means like how far back you are from the um, street line or the, or the sidewalk. And there's like, if you're on the corner, then you have a side setback and if you're on the, um, if you only, if you're not on the corner, you only have a front setback. So that's what setback usually means. The court in that case made clearly made the right decision to suggest that there was no conflict there because they could still grow their flowers within the greenhouses and it didn't restrict their the agricultural that activities the that they were performing saying. under camp. So in this case here, we have a situation where the state came out and said, you can have chickens, you can have chickens on this site and you can put them right here. And the township said, no, we don't like it there. And so our folks moved it to somewhere else. And now they, and they said, okay, we'll put it here. And now the township says, no, we don't like it there either. Clearly, clearly, this ordinance that does not allow a coop in the front yard is in conflict with the state of Michigan GAMP that says they need to be within uh, outside of 250 feet from a non-residential, uh, non, uh, non-farm resident, and therefore this is where it should go. That's the issue, and such as that conflict exists, the, the preemption rules apply. Thank you. Uh, this is a set of civil infraction zoning violations, and as uh, Ms. Kaufman indicated, this burden is a preponderance of evidence. Um, but most of the evidence I don't think is in dispute. The arguments are all legal. legal. So we can spend four hours putting in all the evidence, but I'm looking for a way perhaps we can uh, agree on what facts it is we're arguing about. Yeah. Um, Ms. Kaufman, what's your thought? It's the township's position that when the citations were written, there was not GAMS compliance because it was based on initially, and I think this is probably attached to your memo of law as well as mine, November 17th, a letter from Mr. Corson, who's here, that specifically says at the time of the review, when I was on your property, November 10th, I was unable to confirm the following items are meeting the practices in the site selection GAM. So as of November 17th, there was no GAMS compliance on this property. Mr. Coleman then went out and wrote a citation on November 30th, because if there is no GAMS compliance, the defendants cannot use the Right to Farm Act as a shield against a nuisance violation. The Right to Farm Act, as noted, is an affirmative defense. It can be used as a shield against a violation. It cannot be used as a sword to allow somebody to do whatever they want. So as of November 30th, we believe those citations are valid um, and should be, and the defendant should be found responsible for violating the ordinance at that time because they were not in GAMS compliance. Well, here's a question. They said, we can't find that you are in compliance. They don't say you aren't in compliance. And who decides? Some bureaucrat from the Department of- Mr. Corson uh, decides, and the letter he wrote on May 31st clearly states, you are in compliance with all relevant GAMS that apply to your property, and he lists them. I have done enough Right to Farm Act work where Mr. Corson does inspections and I I interpret them on the municipal side to know exactly what his letters will say and if he doesn't say you're in compliance that means you're not so um, this letter november 17th which said i am unable to determine did not say you're in site selection compliance so it's the township's position and on that date as of november 17th they were not in compliance all right well let's assume that's true uh there's still a couple of issues one they say they've moved them okay so i take issue with her like I have interpreted this, and so I'm going to testify. I think you should bring him in so he can speak to his own words. But that's really what the law is. The law is very much 
about wording and not just legalese wording because obviously we feel like we need a whole new <laughs> vocabulary and, and a whole new speech therapist to get us to the legalese part of life, right? But there's also that shall versus shall and will versus may, you know, uh, defendants may do this is option, whereas defendants shall do this is instruction, like there's no option to it. And here we are right now where words really do count. You know, it's not you are not in compliance. It's I have not been able to find that you are in compliance. So if they intended in like in the general conversation how we generally say well i haven't been able to find that and then you may interpret it to the fact that it doesn't exist or the fact that i haven't been able to find one way or the other really because i haven't been able to give a definitive assertion or definitive definition that you are or are not in compliance so when you know when um uh, when inspectors are writing things up, you want definitive language so you know when you are or are not, when you shall or shall not, versus giving me may, <laughs> can't find it. So what does that mean? Does it exist? Does it not exist? What's the determinative? So now we come to court really quibbling over small detailed words that really have major impacts, right? So that's where we are here. This is a legal argument all day long, all day long, simple wording. <laughs> so that violation no longer exists, but you're saying it was in existence on November 30th. That's correct, Your Honor. All right. Second, they argue a couple things. When we moved in, there was no such ordinance. And after we moved in, the ordinance was changed and the ordinance was changed incorrectly. So there was no ordinance prohibiting this. Con okay, so incorrectly doesn't really get um, hammered out in the in today's uh, hearing, but I really believe it's just relative to the fact that they're not saying that necessarily incorrectly versus they're saying in conflict with um, the state's uh, agricultural law allowing them the right to farm. And so we'll find out more about that as we go. Conduct on that date. Is that correct, Mr. Morgan? That's correct, Your Honor. Is what your argument is? In part, yes. Okay, so that's a legal argument, not a factual argument. But um, so, all right. So you're claiming that on November 30th they were in violation. They claim they've rectified it. Uh, all right. So we're going down a path that I wasn't really seeking. The question is, can we stipulate to a lot of these things? Uh, the, the fact that these um, uh, the situation was as Mr. Kuhlman would testify it was on November 30th. I don't think is in dispute. Um, all right, so then we go to the next date, December 6th. Um, and uh, that's the second set of citations. And again, these are hard to read because they're very small and my eyes are not that great. But um, after letters being set and no response from the property owners and the Department of Agriculture indicates they are not in compliance, violations are still present. Now move an accessory structure to the front yard, which is not allowed. So sometime between November 30th, I guess, and December 6th, they moved the structures to the front yard. And so again, I don't think that's in dispute that these buildings got moved there. And uh, this has to do with uh, placement of the accessory buildings. Um, and they've got a couple arguments. A, these aren't accessory buildings under the definition because they're portable and they aren't big enough. And two, these do comply with GAMPs. Uh, so the fact that the buildings were there in the front yard on December 6th, I also don't believe is in dispute. Is that correct, Mr. Morgan? Yes, sir. And we have the December 13th violation letter. After letters being sent and no response from the property owners and the Department of Agriculture indicates they're not in compliance, violations are still present. Now moved another accessory structure into front yard, which is not allowed. So all three of these have to do with the accessory structures rather than the actual um raising chickens on this parcel of property am i correct yep yes your honor all right so there's no specific citation currently in existence that says raising chickens on this parcel violates township ordinance all three of these have to do with the accessory buildings mr Coleman, november 30th was accessory buildings as well uh, what was november 30th november 30th was the chickens that were within 200 well let me relook at that ticket oh so Section 46747. This is like getting a ticket. So November 30th, 
Uh, is should be 46 292 on November 30th, Your Honor. All right, so that's chickens. No, that's it's Your Honor, if I may, it's a uh, section 46 292 only deals with setback requirements for buildings. Okay, that's right. That was the 250 feet from the neighbors. Well, the 250 feet from the neighbors is a requirement Steve. under the GAMPs right. and DART uh, conformity issue. That's not what the citation cites or mentions. It mentions 46 292, which is the township's setback requirements for buildings from property lines. All right. Uh, which she argues was in violation at that time. You argue since been rectified. So is there a specific citation regarding raising chickens, ducks, and roosters uh, in violation of township ordinance? Or are we all just dealing with building setbacks? I believe, Your Honor, at this point, it's dealing with the location of accessory structures because under the GAMPS, under the right to farm at GAMPS, and category three, it was ultimately determined by Mr. Corson that this site is suitable. The only issue was where on this site could they have their animal containment area? which is where the animals are supposed to be contained within. Okay. And under the GAMP, it can't be within 250 feet of a non-farm residence. Got that. So right now, if they took all, let's assume they are accessory buildings and they're all removed. They take all the buildings away. Um, they're not in violation of any of these sections of the ordinance. Um, and if Mr. Morgan's argument is correct that these buildings are not within the definition of an accessory building, they're not in violation there either. So there may be a factual dispute as to that. Um, well, that that section, I do want to point to the section 46-653 that talks about portable storage sheds, subsection 6. It says only one is permitted for a dwelling, and then in order to have them in the front yard, they have to have a special exception use, which the applicants have not applied for. So the, the issue, of whether, you know, even if we, and, and the township does not admit at all that this is not, this is just a portable storage shed, but even if we were to go to that point, 46 653 sub 6 says only one such one, one such storage shed, and then in order for them uh, to be fried, excuse me, waterfront, so just one. So I guess there is an issue of if there's two. Yeah, not the special uses. Right, you're, you're correct. All right, so what is factually in dispute, Mr. Morgan, anything? I don't think so. I mean, we can certainly put um, Mr. Holmes on the stand and testify to the fact that these built, that this this coop in the front yard is less than 64 square feet and he's measured it and it's portable and it's obviously portable. Uh, they moved it, you know, from the backyard to the front yard and you can hook it up to their little John Deere tractor. I'm, I'm willing to proffer that to the court here so we can kind of save time and move on, but that is what we, he would testify to. And you know, I think examples, and I set this forth in the brief, of an accessory building. And what we're really talking about is, you know, a fixed foundation shed that's bigger than eight feet, that's around 10 feet, you know, where you keep your tools. They don't, the township says, we don't want those in your front yard. And that makes sense. Uh, that would just look weird, I guess, to have everyone's shed blocking the house in the front yard. Well, um, does it look any less weird if it's 75 square feet and there's a shed in your front yard? So, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. But to that point, uh, Your Honor, there's uh, shrubberies that line this road and there's no neighbors across the street. There's nobody that, that sees this coop. Now, everybody that drives by does, but uh, you can see it for a, a moment there as you're driving by. Yes. All right. Um, okay. Um, and the documents that we're referring to were in that 196 page packet that was uh, filed by Officer Pullman uh, back in March, a day or two before the hearing. Um, The ticket was 46.6.292, the November 30th ticket. 46.291 applies to the raising of chickens. If I have a copy of 46292, then these are probably in the pleadings. Okay, so they go through which law is applicable. The, the issue becomes a great deal that the um, citations are not citing the correct code for which they want to call an issue to the property. Problem that they're in correctly defining the property, so. I don't think I have a copy of 46292. The judge will get down to it. Come on, Judge Monica Schultz. 
I, of all the exhibits I attached, I bet it is not one of them. I have one, Your Honor, if you'd like me to approach. Yes, ma'am. It's just as you, as you looked at it, it's, as you know, it's something that's the thing. Okay, so she's right showing so, um, okay. defense counsel. Okay, right. so one of the things that um, we had seen Judge Simmons case where there was a litigant that was on Zoom and then there was a litigant that was in the court. And she's like, you know, this is an in-person hearing. Why are you not here? And she's like, oh, you just told me if I dropped off my paperwork, I could come in. She's like, what are you talking about? This nonsense that says in person. Um, so the reason is because when you are in court and you're in a trial, it's best to be in court as much as possible because if you have a paper, you can just walk right over and give it to your neighbor, give it to the judge. Whereas when you're on Zoom and you've given, you dropped off your evidence, but you haven't given it to the opposing counsel or the opposing side, they have a right to that evidence too. So it becomes an issue because now the court's making copies and it, they make a full copy. And so that's probably, or the other part was when the um, opposing counsel who walked into court had evidence to give to her and she's on Zoom. So now they got to um, scan it up and email it over. It becomes very complicated. So being in court can eliminate some of that complication. And I really, um, there was a very proper way for the counsel to go. Plaintiff's counsel went over to defense counsel and said, look, here's the ordinance or, you know, here's the law that we are, uh, the judge is asking. I have a copy and give it to him. Do you confirm that this is what I'm giving him? Because you, you don't want to just walk up and give the judge something because what if it's, you know, not the right copy or it has something else associated with it? You want to make sure that both sides agree that that's proper. Yes, please do give that to the judge, whatever. 4692. All right, the November 30th citation alleges a violation of 46292. Doesn't have anything to do with chickens. It has to do with setback. No building or structure or any enlargement thereof shall be erected in conformance with the following lot area. Nothing to do with chickens. All Minimum yard buildings. setbacks, single family residential, Setback 40 feet front, 35 feet to the side. 40 feet from the front, 35 feet side setback. So location of all right. So that's structure. What's cited in the November thirtieth tickets? Um, May I clarify something? Here? Yes. So the only, to my understanding and my reading of that citation of November thirtieth, is it cites a violation of that section forty six point two nine two. And the only possible argument or fact issue it would be because this is, if you recall, the time when the coop was in the backyard. There, and by the property line that would have been across from the neighbors and it, the requirements in the setback there is it can't be closer than 35 feet it has to be at least 35 feet away from the property line so if there was a violation to establish here that would be the factual question was the coop within 35 feet of the property line and it wasn't and we would also have All right, well, mr coleman you agree with that uh, well bad. just a minute i probably should swear people mr and mrs holmes you both raise your right hand uh mr coleman mr corson would you as well uh, everybody who may give testimony here, do you all swear or affirm any testimony would you give in this matter would be true to the best of your knowledge? Okay, and so, all right. um, okay, so I'm sorry. He is swearing in those who will be witnesses, such as the, um, the officer, the zoning officer is in court, and then the defendant. The conversation that's been had so much now, though it seems like there's a lot of evidentiary statements going on, those are being offered by the um, counselor, so they don't need to be sworn in. They're not testifying. Officer Kuhlman uh, has testified in this court dozens of times, if not more than that, on uh, zoning matters and other matters. Um, and uh, was this accessory building within 35 feet or 40 feet of the adjoining property? No, I have a direct measurement related to trespass on the property, Your Honor, but I do not believe it was. Well, that's what the alleged violation in 46292 is. So one, I don't think it fits that statute. And two, it's been rectified. So I don't believe there's probable cause to believe that these defendants violated section 46292. I think what happened is he meant to cite 46291. And so here's the thing. It's just like if you get a traffic ticket, if the officer fails to put the correct citation down the correct code down the correct violation and you go to court and it doesn't align with the facts to get thrown out and this is what's happening um 
there's there's going to come a time when there's going to be some res- respectful disagreements, but nonetheless, it is still respectful. <laughs> and the judge's word shall shall uh, reign true, as it is the last word. But that goes to anybody who is a, um, a permit officer or a zoning officer, if you or any type of officer that needs to have a citation. If you're putting down a citation, double check, triple check. I know you do things. Um, fast and, and repetitively that it just seems like that's the one it is but if you miss a digit or put the wrong digit you come to court and they fight it we're in this scenario where it doesn't apply and now the ticket's getting thrown out the citation is, is thrown out it didn't happen so it isn't a violation of 46 292 when the defendants are found not responsible in those two tickets and you have to you can't just now there is the at all you can do something like that if your um, policy is allows for it, but there you have to give the defendant a notice. You have to make them aware, put them on notice as to what they have done wrong. So if the citation has to give them some kind of balances to, or some kind of a direction as to what they've done wrong. So you can't just say, oh, well, you know, in that general area, it has to be quite specific. So being off a digit or two makes a major difference because if that next paragraph is, um, you know, doesn't apply and does has nothing to do with the set of facts, then it becomes obsolete and it gets thrown out, thrown out on its face because it's not applicable, right? So make sure that you're being precise because they, as defendants, need to be on notice so they know what they are responding to, what they are accepting liability for, or what they can, in fact, uh, defend themselves against. Only your mama can say just because I say it, so. <laughs> All right, let's go to you tell them they're wrong. <laughs> Those are alleged to be a violation of section 46 653 accessory buildings <clears throat> unless a special exception use permit has been granted unattached accessory buildings and other accessory structures on any lot of five acres or less in residential districts or on any five acres having less having less five acres or less having residential units in agricultural districts no building shall be erected in any required yard except a rear yard or side yard. So these are in the front yard. I think that's undisputed. Um, and then it goes on in section five to site residential districts. The defendant argues, and let's find the section that he is citing, that these buildings don't meet the definition of an accessory building. So we need to look to the section which describes an accessory building. Um, could you direct me there? Yes, sir. Uh, I believe in the same section, but further, uh, further. It's sub six. Six. Yeah. All right. Turn the page. It should be right at the top. All right. Brett, somebody put these in. I put some things in yellow, and I think you guys did this. All right. So we've got a building in the front yard. That's not in dispute, and it was moved because of gap issues, not township zoning issues they were within compliance of section 292. They weren't within 35 or 40 feet. Only when GAMP applied did they have to move it more than 250 feet from the adjoining property. So after they met with Mr. Corson sometime between November 17th and December 6th, they moved the buildings to the front. Portable sheds and similar structures not affixed to permanent foundations and not exceeding 80 square feet are not considered accessory buildings. <clears throat> Boom goes the dynamite, right? That's vocabulary words, I tell you. Sometimes it's just defining something that can help you win the overall matter. So this is a major win right now for the defense because the defense has a 64 square foot building. So because it's less than the 80 square foot requirement, it is be it's considered a shed, a storage unit and not the dwelling, accessory dwelling that the city wanted to cite it as. So see, the city is not always right. Um, 
everyone, is, every uh, unit and governmental entity is made up of persons, right? And so there is the possibility of mistake. So it's good to read and know your rights, read up on things, read the code that you're being cited for because they, in, they didn't respond according to the city. But I guess in some kind of response is that they um, ignored them enough that they <laughs> brought the city went ahead and brought them to court to have court intervention. Um, and this is good for them because now they're getting a def definition that's very favorable to them. It's less than the 80 square foot that's required to be defined as an accessory dwelling unit, which has these extra requirements of pulling permits and ex uh, exceptions to have it in the front yard. Now they can have it in the front yard. because Must be cited in conformance with all sections. Only one such storage building is permitted for a dwelling, regardless of the Why number of lots or parcels on which the dwelling is situated. Issue overall. So Speaking these that, are referred to as portable storage to. sheds. And only one such storage shed is permitted, regardless of the number of lots or parcels. But such sheds may be in addition to the number of accessory buildings permitted under subsection 5. Such structures must have a minimum width of 6 feet. Such structures plan to be sited in the front yard require special exception use permits. So. These are not under definition by defendant's offer of proof. Your Honor. Accessory buildings, yes? <laughs> um, the, the authority who gets to interpret the zoning ordinance is the zoning administrator. I'm assuming since he wrote the citation that he did not consider these coops to be portable storage sheds. Okay, well, that, that's a factual dispute. Right, so I just. She gets into these assertions that just make a person go, what? You say, what? They get into these, are you saying? You're gonna tell the judge he can't judge. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? He just read it. And there this whole interpretation, I assume that he didn't think the storage unit was the coop would be considered a storage unit. He didn't say excluding animal housing or coops. There's no exclusion to that. There is the factor of what the definition is, and you can't just turn around and say, Well, I don't think he meant it that way. Well, it's not, you know. Intent is good to have an argument for when it comes down to the law. That is true because intent does matter to a certain extent. However, when you're talking about definitions, definitions are kind of to the point. Intent is more of like the the governance and the restrictions of something. But the definition of something, I think that's just kind of like, let's not even argue that. That is what it is, right? If you're less than 80 square feet, then you are shed. You are storage. If you're more than eight square feet, you are a dwelling, and you need a certain you need a permit, and you need, you know you need to have a certain setback, and so so forth and so on. Bring that up to your attention. Um, but and you got to have an argument, right? Power. If you come to court, you got to sure. argue something. Um, Officer it's Coleman, like <laughs> um, you issued these citations on <laughs> like December the 6th say, only the under Section 46653, can... which encompasses Fine. the whole statute. Um, <laughs> You know that so, was part of the in issue. your opinion you knew that that was going to come up because the defense there's nothing new in court and in fact when there is something new in court you hear a whole lot of objections and the other side is rallying and just like the y and l e like the trial is like objection that's you know that's not an evidence objection on our rule that we would not you know bring that the motion to eliminate three was one da, 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 da. you know you hear all these objections there's nothing going on here, right? So she knew that the other side was taking issue with the definition that was being asserted to them. She knew that the other side said, these are not as, uh, dwellings, these are in fact storage units. She knew, she knew because the judge is being presented the argument in the brief. Guess what? The brief goes to the other side too. So they get to see it too, she knew. So bring in the commissioner if you want him to define this ordinance even further which would probably be the argument if you wanted it even more restrictive of a definition, then you need to appeal and amend that definition and not come to court and superimpose it on these particular litigants because they can only abide by the law that was enacted at the time. But nonetheless, that's a whole different- And are these accessory buildings or portable storage sheds? I believe they're a shed, Your Honor, which still under the ordinance requires them to meet the setback requirements. So her witness, who is the officer, the zoning officer, he can't lie to the court. He wouldn't do it anyway. I mean, all of this, um, this the, 
we had when we had the um judge manning case and i think it was litigant johnson was like i wasn't personally served i wasn't personally served how'd you know to be here oh there's something that was on the ground that had my name on it did you read it no i had my girlfriend read it remember him with his ridiculous argument a person with a license is not going to put their license on the line for you this gentleman is not going to put his license on the line for the township he's going to you know be as honest as possible based on what he knows and truthfully and rightfully so so is she she's going to be as honest as possible as she knows it um her interpretation is a little different than than i like but whatever and no matter what she says he's honest so again yeah, based on this definition it's a storage unit it's you have to base it on the definition you don't want it to be a storage unit because it's a coop and it's annoying your ta- your your neighbors in the in the area i got it but it is what it is Define it as a storage unit. Not so, a because they moved them, it would require a permit. They would have had to submit for a zoning application to move them to a different location on the property. All right, so they don't meet the definition of accessory buildings, but they do meet the definition of portable storage sheds. That is correct, Your Honor. Yep, so then nothing. And, and Your Honor, if I may, uh, we would acknowledge that a non accessory portable shed would still, again, apart from preemption of camps, would still have to meet the setback requirements of the front yard which is 40 feet and where it currently is is more than 40 feet from the road we believe that it is in compliance with that setback requirement well all right currently under section two unless a in addition to the setback requirement they shall not be erected in any required yard except a rear yard or side yard and these are in the front yard although that section refers to accessory buildings not That's storage sheds. Not storage sheds. Right. Right. so be in the front I, I guess my point, Your Honor, right, is that, so that would apply if this were an accessory building. Otherwise, all that applies is the setback requirements under the staff, under the ordinance. Correct. Okay. And also the number. So what that means is don't interrupt the judge as he's making a definition. Because <laughs> you just added like these other facts that he's like, wait, okay, but I'm dealing with. <laughs> all right, so that, that, that's the next question. So we haven't got the gaps yet. But, uh, yeah, there's one in compliance with the setback, yes. There are around the oh, nearly. How many are there? Well, there's two. Uh, the second, uh, the, the one that we're, we've been focusing on here is the bigger one that, you know, I'm sure your honor has seen passing down the road that is still less than 64 square feet. But basically, for, for visually, it would look something roughly eight feet by eight feet. There's another smaller unit that I need to three feet. Yeah. Yeah. Two and a half by three feet. Uh, much smaller unit that is tucked away off, I guess, technically, perhaps still in front yard, but honestly, it's by the woods. It's kind of on the side yard, side ish, front ish. Probably would not have seen that one from the road. So, Officer Pullman's opinion, and the issue of the citation because of that opinion, is that only one such storage shed is permitted. And to put more than two, you would need a special exemption use permit, or to put more than one. So, you need a permit for the second one. All right. I agree and so, one of the things that I had thought of was that. <clears throat> Because in their original argument, they were stating that having the two was a part of um, the Right to Farm Act requirements. And I didn't know if like you had a coop where the uh, animals or the birds are housed, and then maybe a second storage for some type of sanitary issue or secondary concerns. But it, I think it kind of comes out in the wash that it's really not necessary. It's just really another second housing uh, unit um and that doesn't really put forth the need to have both so we're fighting about a three foot by three foot shed on the side yard of this parcel of property it's placed there without a special exemption use permit but the defendant claims i don't need a special exemption use permit because of the right to farm act and i'm complying with generally accepted agricultural management practices uh, i can't believe we're fighting about a three and a half by three and a half foot structure but that's and that's the thing so here's a good signal to the plaintiff. Like it's a, the judge is saying that it's a small structure and that the next concern is, does the second structure, um, is it become necessary or is it a part of the um, Right to Farm Act rules, like the agricultural ordinances and orders to do proper farming of these particular breeds or whatever they are. I think they're, so they're, it's rooster, 
chicken and ducks are the three animal types that are on scene. So I think that's kind of why when they get in a break, they come to a resolution. That's where we are. Because she gets- We're not fighting, things. we're really fighting about. We're, we're not chickens. really fighting about much. Um, Do you want to fight about the chickens, but you can't win that. Right, um, so we are up. accepting okay. the facts that there are two of these. One is permitted if it's a storage shed, two are not. Uh, we also agree there is no special exemption use permit um, they could requested just or permit, granted. Okay? Let's go get um, Go fly. Uh, so, Ms. Coffin, where are we on that <laughs> one? Your Honor, I, I believe that's a correct analysis. I think um, we can probably get, as we walk through this, we're probably going to get to the point where Attorney Morgan and I argue over if this is a total preemption or if there's um, some way that the township zoning also applies over as a second parallel regulatory scheme because the township believes it's not conflict. So um, I think we will ultimately get to that point as, as far as I understand because the following citations were for having more than one in the front yard. All right, well, let's parse out the next ticket. Okay. And this is really, this is what judges do so well. You come in with 5,000 arguments and this is a complaint. The complaint has 5,000 arguments and you really start off with your best three, right? And the others are like, we really got a case here, your honor. Sure you do. But by the time you get to court, the judge is like, okay, we're gonna skin the bat, <laughs> get rid of these, get rid of these little flyaways that don't really concern us. Get back to what the real issue is. And truthfully, the real issue doesn't even get to get litigated because you not once put it in your complaint. It's not, you didn't cite them for it, but you couldn't. You really couldn't cite them for having the chickens and the roosters because in fact, they're allowed to by the state law, right? So then you start citing them for other things like setbacks and second structures. And the setback is correct. They're, the, they're 40 feet back. So their setback is not the problem. Um, now it seemingly is the only uh, issue is going to be the second structure. They're only allowed for one in the front, but now they could take Your it, of, uh, it somewhere else. Procedure, Obviously, I guess, as we're talking about this next from ticket. The neighbors. Uh, it looks so to me. They ha so they're juggling a lot of sets of laws, different sets of laws, I should say. They're juggling the fact that they have the right to farm, but in accordance to the right to farm, they have to be 250 feet away from the non-farming um, neighbor, right? So the second structure can move to the back as long as it's 250 feet away from the non-farming neighbors and they're, you know, depending on their, on the corner or whatever, I don't know where they're located, but whatever's surrounding them. The ordinance says they can have um, storage structure in the front, not dwellings, but storage structure in the front, in a storage structure is uh, anything less than the 80 square feet, which it is, it's 64 square feet. And that's the bigger one. And the smaller one is even smaller than that. I guess it would be something like, what? What would it be? I don't know. Cause I don't know, I don't wanna, let's not do that. <laughs> let's not get confusing. Anyway, it's smaller, right? It's two by three, it's two by three feet. So if, or three by three. So if that particular structure is nine, nine square feet or whatever, if that particular structure is small enough and can be far away enough, 200 feet away, 250 feet away from the um, non-farming residents, then they can put it in the back. They just can't put it in the front because they can't allow for two in the front, only one in the front. That apart from a change ticket number and a new date, that it is exactly the same so the 12 6 22 and the 12 13 22 tickets are well, identical. I, I noticed that when i looked at them yesterday carefully um uh 12 6 11 a.m and the language checks the box zoning ordinance and the comments after letters being sent and no response from the property owners and the department of agriculture indicates they're not in compliance violations are still present now moved an accessory structure into the front yard which is not allowed that's an identical language uh from the ticket of december 6th so on december 6th they were alleged to be in violation a week later on december 12th they're alleged to be in the same violation so do you get a ticket every day uh for the same thing um once a week and we're fighting about a three foot by three foot structure which is look the city said move it <laughs> and so this reminds me of like when 
you have your car parked um, street sweeping day and it's on one side, if you keep it there, they're not going to be able to reteach you that day. But if you switch it to the other side the next day and it's sweet street sweeping day, the next day, then they're going to take you all over again. And you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have two of these. If you're on the wrong side of the street, one on one side, one on the other side. And if you do that too often, say you do that one week and another week, then they might turn around and tow your car. Is a you have a problem in where to park. Storage shed under the definition of the statute. Mm -hmm. um, so can you help me there, Ms. Kaufman? It appears to be an identical citation for the identical violation. Ms. May I defer to Mr. Coleman yes, to provide Mr. testimony? Yes. So there's two, and I believe the second one on the 13th has moved another uh, accessory shed. So I got a call on the 6th that they oh, moved okay. the there's one. Okay, so an, another. So it's, an, it's not identical. There was an additional. Uh, now you call it accessory structure. Is this an accessory structure or storage shed? Yes, they're synonymous, I guess. So are there three, by December 13th, are there three there? Synonymous. Not synonymous. Oh, poor, poor, poor zoning um, officer. So this is the thing that I was saying before, um, and hopefully it didn't get cut because <laughs> I've had to do this video over it. But when you are citing as, a, as an officer, or whatever, you get into doing this repetitiously that you may, you know, put a digit off or cite something a little um, particularly wrong. And this is this issue. Um, additionally, earlier we found out that he had put, you know, the wrong citation. He was one digit away from what the judge thinks he should have cited. And then now we're finding out that um, he's considering the dwelling in sheds to be a synonymous definition when in fact the ordinance says that they're not. They have two separate definitions in the ordinance. So, um, you know, as officers and, and those who are writing citations, you're keeping up with your CLEs, your continued educations, and you're also working on not just getting into the rut of doing it. Look it back up when you're writing the citation, take the time to look at the citation and determine that you're writing the correct um, citation down and you're using the correct um, definition because now you're in court here finding out that your definitions are not correct and your citation is not complete. Well, there's two. So originally these were both in the backyard. Okay. On December 6th, I got the call that they moved the one which would be in the front yard on the west. It's I went out to photograph that issue, that citation. Then that's, on the 13th, I got the another call that said they moved another one from the, the backyard. Neighbors are like, the shut the damn so house. So that's on the, on the six, six, there's only one structure there? That is correct. All right. Then that doesn't violate the statute. I find the defendant's not responsible for the December 6th violation. All right. So see, because you're using wrong definitions, he was thinking that the dwelling and the storage structures were one and the same definitions and the court has already found based upon the, the law and the writing of the ordinance, there are two separate definitions. And he was thinking that these structures were in fact the dwelling definition and they're not, the court has found that they are the um, storage structure definition. Consequently, the storage structure definition allows for one to be in the front yard. So the, for the, the ordinance, I mean, for the citation that says, oh, the first one was in the yard and it's not supposed to be in the yard because it's dwelling is incorrect because it's not a dwelling, it's a storage shed. And the ordinance does allow for the storage shed to be there. So that one gets, <laughs> it's, like, it's like, it's like the best thing about our ticket you always wanna do is just toss it up into the wind, right? You just wanna get rid of all the tickets, right? Because you just don't ever wanna have to pay them. Well. This is what the court is doing for this litigant for the second ticket, right? One of the two that's in question right now, just because they had the right to have one in the front yard. It's when they had the second one becomes a whole new issue. Now we are fighting about the three and a half foot by three and a half foot building on December 13th. This carries a five hundred dollar fine, um, and uh, am I reading too much into this, Mr. Kuhlman? Um, Was one of these supposed to cite Section two ninety one? Yes, Your Honor. Um, and regarding the, the other two, the six fifty three, and uh, the other two citations, and no disrespect to you at all, Your Honor, but. 
they should, should have still had a zoning permit and be permitted even though they were under the 80 square feet um, and there was never any permits required or applied for thank you i don't consider that disrespectful you we always have a right to disagree uh but my opinion carries more weight than yours does and you don't like it i guess you can appeal it to somebody else um, you're not judge, jury, and executioner. You interpret it, and then it goes before court, and the court makes a ruling on it. Uh, I say but, no disrespect, Your Honor. But you, you've been doing this a long time, so your opinion does carry weight. But my original question is... All right, so I love that. Isn't that just so cute? It's like, you know, I, I, do not I do not agree, Your Honor, and I do not want to give any disrespect. And you're going to say, hey, it's no disrespect. I respect you, too, but just know you have a voice. My voice just happens to carry more weight. <laughs> So we respectfully disagree. And since I'm the judge, I shall judge this. Thank you so much for your opinion. And you can appeal it if you want to. Um, I kind of side with the judge on this. I don't know that it's going to be an appealable issue, you know, to each his own. I, I will actually, because I know how this is ending, it's not going to be an appealable issue. But in some other matter, would this be an appealable issue? I don't think so. Because the judge has given the definition. The definition is not dwelling. Dwelling is that which would require the, the special, um, would require the permit for the moving. And it's not a dwelling, it's a storage unit. The storage unit is allowed to be in the front. The only only time they would need the special use permit is for the two of them. And since they do have the second one, then that does require the special use permit, but um, they resolve that in a different way, so. They were not cited with 291, the chicken ordinance. Was right. that an they oversight? Didn't cite them. All right, so, what, what? so here we are. It was an oversight. Wondering how many angels could dance on the head of a pin over. And it's uh, now mute, can't do nothing with one, three foot by three foot storage shed in the front yard on December 13th, um, which means to get where we need to get. Okay, let me, he's going to give a great analogy. I want you to hear this, but I also want to just chime in just a little bit. So the reason why he's kind of hampering on why didn't you do this particular ordinance citation versus the ones you did, because the opening remarks from the plaintiff's counselor was very, um, telling it expressed the fact that you know they're using a shield of having the right to farm but yet they were not in compliance with the right to farm during the dates of these citations right so they shouldn't have that type of coverage because they weren't in compliance with them this is true they weren't in compliance until january so these tickets are like november and december time right but the problem is on a twofold. One is the citations that they were citing was for dwellings. And that is a mute issue because it wasn't a dwelling. These are storage units. And the other problem is they never got cited for the chickens. So and he's like, was that an oversight? And he's like, yeah, it was oversight because they want to assert that they didn't have the right to have the chickens on those days. So that's why they were getting cited for those days in non-compliance of the right to farm ordinance so that's why that argument or that uh, back and forth is going on because the plaintiff put up the argument they're going to have to be properly cited with the correct section we're fighting about a bunch of stuff which is in the stands where the game is inside the stadium um i love this analogy it's truthfully the case like you we're, we're talking about all the things up in the air but your reality is what you should be talking about is chickens. That's the thing you had an issue with truthfully. And so did your um, complainants who were the surrounding neighbors. And they're like, they have chickens. They're farming chickens and they're in my yard. They have roosters. They're making a whole bunch of noise too early in the morning. Da, 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 da. So these are the real complaints that are coming into the city. And the city is sending the zoning officer to go out and to see what's going on and then to write them um a ticket for non-compliance for whatever issues are at issue well he fails to do so for the chickens in and of themselves and consequently their argument for the right to farm is really a mute argument even though the defendant wants to assert that as a defense it doesn't become a true defense because during the times of the citations they legitimately did not have the right they had not followed through or completed all of the compliance with the right to farm gap um, program. But 
they never got cited for it. So they they kind of it kind of you know just washes away. And the real issue that everybody has, the real game, the real play by play is not coming before the court. And everyone wants to talk about all these other things that are non factors, truthfully. Or mostly non factors. Just like one issue that becomes a prevailing issue for the plaintiff, but the resolution to that is almost a wash too. They were not ever cited with section 46291, which has to do with raising of chickens and other small animals for domestic use. Um, so they were cited under these accessory structures statutes and we determined that these are not accessory. You know what? Also the defendant had the other assertion of um, defense was that, how did he put it? Uh, that, oh, that they're commercial property and that the definition of commercial property was the sell of one egg and they have sold many. So they they fell under that. So that never even becomes an argument because they don't have that citation before the court anyway. Accessory structures, they're storage sheds. And Mr. Kuhlman contends they needed a special use permit. I concede for two, Stop they do. So but it doesn't appear for one, <laughs> if it's a storage shed, Good that they need a special use permit. So on the 13th, they moved another shed, um, another small structure to the front yard. Um, and we're going to argue whether or not that is a generally accepted agricultural management practice under the Right to Farm Act. Which seems to me to be a giant effort when it isn't really what we're fighting about. And in defense to the defendants, they're entitled to be cited with what it is they're alleged to have done. Um, the township is asking for fines and restitution uh, as part of this violation. So it does appear on its face to violate the statute. Only one such storage shed is permitted for dwelling regardless of the number of lots. Can you guys hear my dog? <laughs> he is like, he just turned one. He snores like a grown man. <laughs> So loud. Can you see my picture? Oh. No, they can't. But I can. Very, no, like, look at the back. Very pretty. Yes, yes, yes. Very pretty. As long as it meets the other setback requirements. Yeah. That's the defendant's argument, which I've accepted. Uh, Mr. Coleman disagrees with that, but that's what the statute says. Um, Your Honor, can I, may I add something? Yes. Uh, just in kind of the stepping back for a second and looking kind of at the full picture of this uh, situation. So, Homes know that they've got these these chicken coops in the backyard, and they have a neighbor here, and the neighbors complained at some point, presumably because the chickens walked onto their yard or this and that. And at some point over time, they had had and none of this has been really addressed here, and it's not what it's its issue, but just by way of context, had some roosters that were too loud, so they slaughtered them. And then they were basically told by the state, you know, we'd rather have these things move further back, so you were, you know, so there's no question of compliance under GAMP in terms of the 250 setback. And I think my folks really, as a part of just trying to do the right thing, moved the coops to the front yard. To get the and, and then they moved the and very much in the same time frame the two coops they got around to one on one day and they got around the, to the, the smaller one on the next day and they got hit the very next day got hit with a citation and it's like dang if you don't and darned if you will kind of a situation here it's almost like a uh, catch as catch can because they've been you know the town what we're really arguing about is the township doesn't want to have chickens correct and so this is like the um every lawyer's disease <laughs> when he, knowing we just shut up like you know every it's like you want to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk because that's what you are you are the mouthpiece you are the advocate you're talking and you're you know pounding the pavement if you will but the judge just said that <laughs> like he literally said it he had a very eloquent um you know a statement he's talking about how you guys are all in the stands and you really want to be in in the ball game and we're so far away from the game you know this is apple and origin, oranges uh, of a comparison. He already spoke to that issue, right? And here comes counselor. It's like, I thought everyone would get it, but I guess counselor was either he wasn't listening or he didn't get it, or he has he has the um, the attorney disease. Can't stop talking. <laughs> and so now they're fighting about whether or not we should put the, don't say where we should put the unit. And well, you can't keep it here because it's too close to neighbors. Well, fine, we'll move to the front. Well, we don't like it there either. <laughs> Um, uh, I understand. I, I, I just wanted to. Well, I, I, that's human context to that. Uh, that's exactly the way I understand it. It's the way you pled it. 
um, and we're using accessory buildings as an effort to abate the chickens. And in my mind, all your client has to do is remove the small building and they'll be in compliance. Now, your argument is over and above that, this complies with the Right to Farm Act. Um, roosters are annoying. I certainly will concede it. Uh, depending on the time you get up. Right? Uh, no question, Your Honor. I, I, uh, I, they have, there hasn't been any issues with, with that. They slaughtered their roost. They might have one. Yeah. And they also just informed me they can move the smaller one back closer to the side yard. They're willing to do that. Well, they still may have issues. Um, generally, most townships require special use permits for storage sheds. Uh, most townships have got setback requirements um, that you can't put a storage shed right on the neighbor's property line. Although if you go to Fisher Lake, you'll see about 50 of them uh, where they're about within one foot of the neighbor's property line. I don't know if they got a special use permit or got grandfathered or nobody noticed, but um, in my neighborhood, there's a lot of them. But generally, the townships have an ordinance. Okay, so Judge, stop telling people where you live and people don't go hunting the judge. Leave him alone. You can't just stick a storage shed or an accessory use building without setback. You can't just do what you want to do generally on your property without being in compliance. And if you're not in compliance, you need to ask for a special use permit, go to the uh, planning commission or the zoning board of appeals and either get permission or don't. Well, that wasn't done here, but they did what they did based on a review by the right to farm act coordinator, Mr. Corson. Um, so they're saying, well, the township told us, uh, it didn't comply with the setback requirements, so we moved it. Standing now it doesn't comply with the zoning requirement that you can't put two in the front yard. Uh, um, this part. So taking the Right to Farm Act out of the equation, the second building would seem to violate Section 6 of 46.653. And it's not argued that they um, did not have a special use permit. Only one such storage shed is permitted. Okay, so he's saying it's not argued, <sighs> meaning that it didn't come up in the complaint. It didn't come up as the um, compliance citation, the lack of special use permit. They were being cited for the wrong things, dwelling, it's dwelling is not applicable, so forth and so on. For a dwelling, regardless of the number of lots. And Officer Kuhlman argues that even if it's only one, they still need a special use permit. I found it takes two. Um, so on its face, Officer Kuhlman's citation of December 13th with the added word. So the judge is saying it takes the second one to be um, to be of issue in order to assert that you need the um, special dwelling permit, I mean, the special use permit. Whereas the plaintiff, they can, and the zoning officer kind of have a difference of opinion. They believe just have the one requires the permit. He says, no, that's another. And that's the issue. That they violates say. that Can't section. The defendants contend that the Right to Farm Act allows yes. them to do it. So that's what we're fighting about right now, whether the Right to Farm Act allows them to site a second storage shed on the property. Um, that could take a long time. So, um, and as Ms. Kaufman points out, it's a shield rather than a sword. So they moved it. Their contention is on the advice of the Department of Agriculture. The township cites them. They're using it as a shield saying we did it because they recommended that. So Ms. Kaufman, where does that lead us? I think, Your Honor, and if I may take one moment uh, to try to put the human scale on this, um, in addition to the Holmes viewpoint, this is the neighbors who live next door. Mr. Coleman, if he needed to, would testify to the repeated complaints that he receives about the chickens roaming in other people's yards, defecating other people's yards, getting hit by cars, and causing trouble. So this is why the township has moved forward to, to undertake enforcement in the first place. But I think where this leaves us right now is, on the, the ticket of the, the 12th or the 13th, I, I'm not sure, it's the exact date. 12, 13. Is... is does do the homes have to comply is the townships zoning a parallel regulatory scheme because as the township intends it does not conflict it allows what the state law allows the state law allows category three 
farm animals in this particular location if the animal confinement area, containment area, can be located 250 feet away from somebody else's property. Okay, that doesn't say that you then don't have to comply with local zoning. I contend, it's the argument of the township that those work in tandem. They're a parallel regulatory scheme. So as long as they can move that confinement area somewhere away, 250 feet away from the other person, the non-farm residents, and somewhere that's in compliance with local zoning, they can have it because we contend it doesn't conflict or completely preempt their parallel regulatory scheme. You know, uh, Mr. Coleman, if he was to testify, would say we told them they needed to get a special exception use permit and the response is we don't have to do anything. The right to farm act preempts totally in, 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 a, in a layman's terms, okay? The township contends instead that the township zoning regulations still apply and they would have to obtain zoning approval. And the township is looking primarily for compliance here. We're not looking to find somebody. We understand how the Right to Farm Act works. We understand Mr. Corson's reviews, and we understand the review that Attorney Morgan provided yesterday to our office. It essentially says- No, I haven't seen that okay. yet. But in summary, and I'm sure he'll be able to give it to you. In summary, as of May 31st, I think the letter was, they found the homes to be in full compliance with all applicable camps. May I approach your honor and I'll provide you with that letter? Yeah. So that is, you know, determinative as of the day of the letter. So as your honor correctly points out, this is now narrowed down to one set of citations regarding, you know, one or one accessory structure and where it's located. Um, the township <laughs> feels very strongly about the fact that if, in fact, oh, GAMP supply and the right to farm act applies and the site selection GAMP complies, um, if we if we needed to go and I know at the March hearing we stipulated to the 2022 story, site selection GAMP, and I was going to walk Mr. Coleman through the testimony about the setbacks tables in that GAMP. There's setbacks for category one sites, new and expanding, and category two sites, new and expanding. There's no setbacks for category three, which is what the homes is. Uh, chicken operation is. It's a category three. So because there's no specific setback in the 2022 GAMP from property line setbacks for category three, it's our contention the township's zoning setbacks and locational setbacks, where on the lot these structures can go, applies. And that's why we cited in our brief the Baptist versus City of Troy for Michigan Supreme Court case. I understand uh, opposing counsel's argument. That took me because the setbacks have been the issues the whole time, but she's saying that it's not GAMP, which is the program for the right to farm. It is the city ordinance that is um, pushing for the setback, but the setback is only 40 feet and 35 feet. That's the only city ordinance setbacks that are applicable. The 250 feet away from non-residential, um, I mean, non-farming residents is a condition of the Farming Act, that's from Gantt. Um, in his briefing as well, but I disagree. This was a Michigan Supreme Court order, and it said local zoning bulk height and locational can control if they're not in conflict. We believe ours are not in conflict. Mm -hmm. We believe it's parallel regulatory scheme. And I, I'm sure Attorney Morgan will argue uh, opposing, but the question is, what is the extent of the, of the GAMPS preemption here? What is their extent? Is it total preemption, or does it allow where there's no specific setback or Category 3 that the township's regulations step in and apply? And I think that's the argument. I think that is the fundamental dispute here yes, sure. but we've come down to one two and a half by three foot storage shed um, so if you're seeking compliance i can give them a fine in order to move the storage shed but that doesn't solve the chicken problem um so we're doing this as a pretext because and i'm willing to do it i'm willing to spend five hours on gamps over this two and a half foot building but what we're really fighting about is chickens and the chickens haven't been cited this is easy to rectify you remove that building which changes essentially nothing for the neighbors um i saw the photographs of chickens wandering around and other property and and uh i don't know how many chickens there are and how bad they smell apparently there's less than 50 units um, 50 animal units is, it could be up to 5,000 chickens so right. that's why that's important i understand they only have a small handful of chickens they have 50 or less okay 50, yeah. um okay so may, if i may consult with mr coleman for yes. a moment let's take a recess i went to the chiropractor yesterday because i'm all crooked up she told me to quit sitting for so long to get up and move around every hour. So right, thank you. we'll take a recess. We'll let everybody take a minute. I'll get up, move around a little bit, do a couple somersaults, and we'll be back. <laughs> yeah, let's in a few do that. Uh, I'm going to shut the live feed off so people can talk. Yeah, let's let's see the somersault. Oh, let's see the action, action. <laughs> All right, so they go on to recess. Um, this is a very interesting matter, just because if you are in thoughts of changing your lifestyle just a little bit. Maybe you're saying, I'm gonna live off my land. I want to start incorporating my own food in my own yard, in my own garden. I, and I wanna have that so that, cause you know, the, um, the, the, the food prices are like out of this world, you know? And then you wanna eat more organic anyway, and you don't wanna spend that high price. Okay, great. This is what you need to contend with. You need to think about and find out what are your zoning laws? What are your ordinances that re, um, have anything to do with your right to farm, your ability to farm on your own land, uh, determine if your land is suitable for such and what type of farming 
would you be doing? Um, you know, would it just be your garden? Are you trying to put chickens and roosters? You know, <laughs> how close are you to your neighbors? Because you know, <laughs> they may have an issue, <laughs> right? So this is very informative. Um, the second video is extremely short. It's extremely short and uh, gets to the resolution of this matter very quickly. So go ahead and see the second video for that particular resolution. I just wanted to make sure that the facts weren't lost. I went ahead and re-recorded this video so that those who are looking to understand what this case is about and what all the ins and outs are, they can see it from the very beginning relative to the, the trial. Um, I, you know, I think that both counselors were very professional, extremely intelligent, and put forth their arguments in a very co cohesive way and very concise. I just personally had high disagreement with some of the plaintiff's assertions and <laughs> representations relative to, you know, being able to her or herself define what the ordinance is and to interpret, whereas the judge was interpreting himself, where, you know, it's just like, he's the judge, judge do judge things, right? Professionals are professional and let professionals do the professional things. And so as the attorney, you can make the arguments, but as the judge, you will make the decision, right? So, so he had to remind um, the zoning officer of that fact, but it was really nice and sweet how they had their interaction, right? Very cool, you know, very respectful to colleagues, respecting each other's position, just disagreeing on, you know, um, what the facts or what the outcome should be. And quite honestly, we can find that all the time, right? When do, when do attorneys agree? The world might be coming to an end, right? If all attorneys can agree on something, I don't know. Maybe First Amendment is the First Amendment. Maybe that's where we, that's where we all agree, right? That's where every legal mind comes together. <laughs> but anyway, I hope you found this entertaining and educational. By all means, please share it with their, someone else. Someone needs to know. I promise you, you just don't understand how many people need to know this. So like, share, and subscribe. Appreciate you all. Lyric Armstrong, your real estate agent and advocate. All right. Lyric Armstrong, your real estate agent and advocate. Just in case, I'm Lyric Armstrong, your real estate agent and advocate. Thank you all for being here. Uh, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. So, in the out of my face. So there you go. It's a little better. Um, we are still in Judge Milton's court only for a little short period of time. It turns out the continuation of the previous hearing on zoning is very short. So let's just jump right in and see what happens. As we know, there is a chicken coop. It used to be in the back. Now it's in the front and somewhere on the side. And somehow the ordinance in the city does want it, but they forgot to cite it correctly. Hmm. Oh, well, let's see what happens. Judge Middleton, we're ready. We're ready for court. We're ready. We're ready. Everybody get ready. Let's make sure you can get in here. Oh, got to make sure it's like, share, and subscribe. Okay. So we're doing our ancillary things, our housekeeping. Make sure you do your own like, share, and subscribe real quick. Judge Middleton's courtroom. Keeping it loud. Only a few minutes to find out, do we really have a zoning violation or not? All right, so defendants are in the court. Yeah, let's see. Wait, wait, wait. I, I like to eavesdrop. The judge is... No, it's uh, it's there. I got one of those right now, too. Location? Township? Their attorneys, they're not going to get us involved at all, or they, they, they're doing it all. Yeah. Yeah, all right, we're back. We're waiting to get all parties lined up again. So that's so that we know we have others around to hear your conversation. So hold on, we've got problems here. I'm about to cash a $50,000 check. <laughs> We're back into court here. You want to be in court? No need to apologize. 
here. We're apologizing for having conversation. Just like, no, I'm just letting you know, we're here. <laughs> we got people on YouTube, right? We've got people. All right. All right, here we go. I didn't do any somersaults, but I did stretch a little bit. <laughs> uh, we didn't miss it, darn. We're uh, back to uh, further hearing on the citations that were issued on December 13th. Here we actually are sped up here. Oh, a little bit. Let's see if we go a little faster. Which would be file number 222388 and 222389. So if you are just now getting this uh, video and hadn't seen the previous one, go ahead and see the previous one because there's way more detail there. This is kind of like the wrap up. It's only a couple minutes of, of um, I guess, judgment that's going to go down. Uh, reality is that there is a zoning violation question. They had several, but the judge threw out a couple and we're down to one. So that's what he's getting ready to rule upon. Fine. And uh, we're discussing uh, what the statute defines as a portable storage shed. Um, Ms. Kaufman, where are we now at this point after our recess? Your Honor, um, Attorney Morgan and I consulted with our respective clients uh, during the recess, and we believe we may have reached an agreement as regards to the citations from 1213 okay. against both Jan Joanna and Gabriel Holmes. Um, the parties have agreed to that the homes will remove the small shed, which is the one described as maybe three feet by two feet from the front yard, relocate it to a rear or a side yard. And that if that shed fell within 250 feet of a non-farm residence, they could not uh, keep farm animals in that shed. The second point is the homes have agreed to contain animals on their property or confine them at least to 250 feet or greater from any non-farm residence. And the third thing, which we didn't quite reach the agreement on, but the town, the neighbors uh, would are requesting that perhaps the homes get rid of their roosters or decrease the number of roosters. Um, and so I, I uh, welcome Attorney Morgan's comments on those points. Thank you. Mr. Morgan? So yes, we are uh, in agreement with that. I think that was accurate um, as to the first two points there. Uh, you know, for the record, my folks were planning on fencing in these chickens so that they can free range, so to speak, within that fenced in area, but have just held off because of this situation, so many unknowns. But doing that will uh, obviously alleviate any concerns going forward in terms of where uh, where these chickens are, if, you know, et cetera, including the roosters. And that, that fenced in area would it would be in compliance of the 250 setback under GAMP, which basically means, again, mostly on this kind of more towards the front. I know that's right. They are not giving up their roosters, okay? Of the yard, which is would include the roosters. It's important to have the roosters because the roosters uh, protect the flock. Yep. And it. if we have part as part of this plan that they would be uh, contained in any event, uh, we think that that would be a. So the containment of the roosters, as you can imagine, is not the issue. It's the containment of the chickens. They've been kind of roaming and been in neighbors' yards, hit by cars. You know, just not really well kept and here's the defense is saying well we couldn't keep them in house because we had so many violations and concerns as to where we could put our coop in the first place if we started encamping them and encaging them then we'd be moving even more stuff so we needed to get this particular element solidified as to where we're allowed to have our uh, coop so now that they're getting the coop um, location in place and, and solidify. They're saying they'll go ahead and encamp them, but they are not getting rid of their roosters. And you know what the roosters do? They make all that dog or noise. <laughs> That's what I bet you if they did not have the rooster, I bet you the neighbors probably wouldn't even care if they were 200 yards close or, or 250 yards, feet, whatever. They wouldn't care how close the coop was. It's the roosters that's working their nerves. Okay, yeah fair way to, to move past these last two and have them just be dismissed without cost. Right so right were there any fines or costs regarding that? And uh, just a minute, is yes, that sir. true, Ms. Kaufman? I'll leave it up to you. That's fine, Your Honor. All right, who's going to do the order? Your Honor, I can do the order. I just want to make sure that we are then saying uh, that the roosters can remain if they're contained in the confinement area as described. So essentially it would be for the two citations from December 13th um, that they're dismissed with the following, they're not dismissed, but I would quibble over that wording because there, from what the ordinance, what the ordinance and the laws that came into play in last video, there was no conversation as to if the animals had to be encamped in a certain place. The coop had to be away, 250 feet away from the neighbor's yard line and 
couldn't, if it was in the front yard, it had to be just a redetermined storage was fine, but it can't be a dwelling. This is particularly a storage. There's a lot of different things that were determined in the, in the previous part of the hearing in the morning before the recess, but the factor that they all have to be grouped together, including the rooster, I don't think that that was, um, I guess it's just their stipulation. Because they're stipulating now, I guess that's why this is going to go in the order, because they're stipulating on both sides that they will keep the animals in cage, the roosters and the chickens in cage so that they're not getting into the street, they're not getting into the neighbor's yard. So I guess, we agree. We'll dismiss um, without prejudice. Dismiss without prejudice. Okay. Without prejudice. With an agreement as follows. Okay. Removal of the small shed to the rear or side yard. Without prejudice means that they can bring this matter back to the court if they need to. With prejudice means you cannot come back. It's like double jeopardy. No maintenance of those, any farm animals within that small shed unless it's at least 250 feet away from a non-farm residence. And then I will, uh, any chickens, ducks, roosters must be at least containment area, confinement area, at least 200. Now we're talking about ducks. Chicken, ducks, roosters, like she wants everything all in one place. That's why I don't know if they do well all together in one place. 50 feet or greater from a non-farm residence. And no, um, I'll remain silent on the roosters. Let's hope the no, roosters no, will remain now. silent. Someone asked me, is <laughs> there a the collar for a rooster like there is for a dog? Um, I've spoken in this hearing before about the roosters in Key West, and uh, I don't like to get up that early, but uh, yes, uh, there are human considerations on both sides of this circumstance. All right, Mr. Holmes, did you hear everything that Attorney Coughlin said? Yes, and you agree with those terms and conditions? Yes, sir. Mrs. Holmes, did you hear everything that was said here on the record? Yes. And do you agree with those terms and conditions? Yes. All right, uh, there will be no fines or costs assessed. Uh, the court found the defendants not responsible on the two earlier tickets. And uh, if you're gonna do the order, and I know you probably object to that, you would rather me do the order on the first two citations or just make it part of this all encompassing? I can order? make it all as part of right. that's your preference. Your all right, so I'd, I'd ask you to add those other citations, right. November 30th and November 6th, the court found the defendants not responsible. Thank you, Honor. All right, summer is here. People are outdoors, animals are outdoors. There's leaves on the trees, which block sight lines and noise lines. Um, I should note, do you have any objection to me receiving what was presented as Exhibit N, which is a letter dated May 31st from Jay Corson of the Right to Farm uh, program? No, Your Honor. All right, Exhibit N will be received. I haven't read it yet, but it was represented to me what was said, but it will be made part of this record. Anything further we need to put on the record? I don't, I don't think so, Your Honor. All right, we'll be in recess. We'll be back for the number of criminal matters. All right, All right you so guys are right. That was harmless, right? Very quick, very, 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 very quick um, ending to that hearing on zoning, we learned a few things. Of course, when two parties can agree, the court is so happy, <laughs> right? Because they don't have to put in anything specific, but the court did find that the defendants were not liable on the first two um, uh, tickets, you know, uh, uh, compliance uh, tickets that they got. And there was only that one issue that came before the court. And then in the end during recess, two calmer heads prevailed. <laughs> Defense and plaintiff's counsel were able to come to an agreement that the defendant would just in, uh, encamp the chickens, ducks, and roosters together. Didn't know they had ducks too. I wasn't, I didn't hear that before because it was mostly the chicken and roosters that were up for conversation for most of the hearing. And now they're going to encamp them together so that they hopefully don't get out. They are more in control, but still have free range. Um, whatever space they have. Obviously, they must have a great deal of space. So they're talking about 250 feet away from their neighbors, right? And 40 feet away in the setback because they're in the front, but they have to be 40 feet back. And then 35 feet away from the side setback. So, you know, and able to do all of that, <laughs> they must have a nice um, lot space. So hopefully it works out well for them and their neighbors can get some rest and stop getting awoken by the roosters. Maybe they need to soundproof their house. <laughs> that's what it sounds like, you know. And that's the thing because you're in 
your neighborhood and you have your rights to farm. And I think that that's a great thing. I think that we should be farming. I think we need to, you know, live off of our land more, even if we are in a city, right? I don't know about roosters and chickens and things and noisemakers, but they don't bother me. I, I can sleep well through all of that. <laughs> Close the window. I'm good. My husband is a light sleeper. He will wake up and be on fire because of the noise because he cannot go back to sleep once he wakes up and he's a very light sleeper. I think men are in general because they're like the protectors of the house. So <laughs> they're protectors of the house. So they're always listening for like, you know, noise that shouldn't be. So I think that's what keeps him up. But um, he would he would die. He would die over some roosters <laughs> being close to the house like that. Um, so hopefully all is well in Michigan. They'll, they'll survive. Hopefully you've learned a few things. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Like I said, this is a really short video just to kind of wrap up Judge Middleton's court on the matter of zoning. So, you know, it, this is an instance where the um, home buyers had bought the house already before the ordinance became enacted and consequently became an issue for them. So this is like sellers and our homeowners understand, you know, beware, be active, be concerned about your neighborhood. Your activism is important to your own self-interest. So make sure that you are attending those meetings and hearings so that you can find out what's going on, what's being proposed and don't get sideswiped. And when you go to vote, look at the fine print, look at the pros and cons, not just that one little paragraph that is, do you know a bill is like a page, like it's almost fills up a whole page on um, 95% of the time, but yet on the, on the, um, the voting sheet, it's like a little synopsis, right? So it's a little abstract as to what the whole thing is. And that's how Prop 19 got passed in California. People were like, oh, yes, firefighters. And oh, yay, I can <laughs> inherit my house. Yes, yes, yes. But then, you know, guess what? You have to live in it. You have to live in it. Otherwise, it gets reassessed. And there's a whole other, you know, tax uh, problem with that because it, it, it really um, attacks the inheritance ability, you know, because you have the inheritance where you can transfer the taxation from your grandmother to your mother to you and so forth now it's written where it's in california you can do that if you live in the property whereas if you are renting if that's the family income property it gets reassessed at, at transfer so you know we're doing things in this world trying to clear up prop 19 so that it's not uh, affecting us negatively in our inheritance um, but a problem, the problem really stems from not reading the whole thing, okay? So when you're going to vote, vote the way you feel is best for you and your family. Of course, I'm not going to tell you how to vote. It's, your, it's up to you. I just ask you to read the whole bill. Read the whole proposition. Read it all. <laughs> Understand all of it before you say yes to it. Because when you say yes, you say yes to the whole. And then now we're in a place where we're trying to appeal certain parts and you don't understand why. And quite honestly, you won't understand until someone's dead and you're too emotional to pay attention, right? All right, so I'm Lyric Armstrong. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, what is wrong with her? <laughs> I'm Lyric Armstrong. You're a real estate agent and advocate. I have to go now because I have little buggy bees in my video, all right? <laughs> Touch you later.